Hey, Kennedy. Hello, Leslie. How you doing? All right. How are you? Good. I see you... that we've got the recording ready to go. It is. The minute I jumped on this thing, it started. Beautiful. You are the first person to jump on here. I figured I would be. I might as well be early. Yeah, it's funny because actually somebody started it at 15 after because um, I got the little you know pop up and um, then I guess they jumped off or something. Oh. Hello, Claudia. Hello, how are you doing? I'm good. Good. Hi, Kennedy. Hey, Claudia. How's it going? Good. Thank you. How are you? Pretty solid. Good. <laughs> I'm a little under the weather. I, I had to. I planned on coming into the office for this, so I would like be in the room with Carmen and Jill, but uh, I didn't want to get anybody sick. So. Oh yeah. Well, that's nice of you. Yes, it is very nice. I'm sure they appreciate that. Yeah, I let everybody know and they were like, good, stay away from us. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm sorry. Good morning, Romana. Good morning. Oh, I am going to mute everyone. <laughs> All right, Kennedy, how do I mute? I'm looking for it under my, well, somebody, they finally, they muted themselves, I think. I think usually you can right click on participants to uh, mute them. <laughs> Hello, Kennedy. Hey, gang. Is that Johnny? It's me. I just what? saw you. Big, big screen on my screen. <laughs> Hello, Rick. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Good, how are you doing, Britt? Good, thanks. How you doing, Britt? I'm hanging in there, Joe. <laughs> Good to see you, Kennedy. Hey, Joe. Happy to see everybody jumping on. Yeah, I didn't know what it was, so. <laughs> <laughs> Took a minute. Yeah. Well, Les Leslie's in charge here. She'll help us out. Leslie's from Real Bay. I went to the, to the um, email. Yeah, I got the email. And we've got quite a few people who are supposed to be joining us, so. We'll give it a little bit of time. I know we're still got a couple of minutes before actual start time, so hang in there. And this is being recorded, so you'll have access to the recording.
Thank you to all our goody goodies who arrived a few minutes early. Yeah, you get you get brownie points for that. Yes. Same thing, I'd ever really have a great Ramon here, but that one wasn't terrible either, so I took that off. Uh, You are the most enthusiastic person I've ever seen to be on a training. <laughs> good morning, Carm. Oh, good morning, Jill. Good morning, Carmen. Good morning. Oh. Yeah. All right, Carmen and Kennedy and uh, Jill, we've got uh, 22 attendees. That includes you all and Claudia and Romana. Um, got 10 more that, excuse me, 16 more that are not on yet. When would you like me to get started? Since we're taping this, you can go ahead. OK, all right. Somebody else. So I just heard somebody knocking on the door here. Hang on. Oh, there are a couple of other people coming on. 
I tell you what, I'll wait until 935, 1035 your time. So what? add a minute. Mm -hmm. What? Okay. Yeah, fine. Yeah, I don't know what I did. All right, guys, we will go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, my name is Leslie Raymond. I am an implementation consultant for Ops Technology, uh, at, which is a real page product. And today and tomorrow we'll be training on uh, how to use Ops Technology. So just a little background here. Um, you all are currently using purchasing and purchasing is going away. And so Corker and Jenison has made the determination that they are going to use Ops Technology uh, going forward as your purchasing and invoicing platform. So this is what the training is going to entail uh, over the next couple of days. Uh, you're all accustomed to using a purchasing platform, so that concept is not new to you, but just to kind of familiarize you with, of course, when we have different softwares, there's going to be differences in how uh, everything behaves and uh, some of the, you know, the dashboards you're going to see. So it's just going to be different for you. Um, but I think you will all catch on to it very quickly. And um, I think you'll, you'll enjoy using this product. So as I was saying, as with anything, there's always going to be some new terminology. So I'm going to um, start with a couple of things today and just to kind of give you a format of how the training is going to work. Um, I'm going to demo uh, each of the different modules, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> as far as the training goes. And then I'm going to have in-class exercises for you. So we will take a little pause after I go over each module, and then I'll put the exercise up on the screen for you all to follow along <clears throat> and participate with. So um, that's the way we're going to, to do it today. So let me start off with, and I'll share my screen now. So some new terminology for you. Um, so just want to make sure that everyone understands a few of these. We will go over each one of these items so that you'll know exactly what's going on. But some of the things you're going to see that are going to be a little bit different from purchasing. Um, and so in ops, we call a WTN, a workflow tracking number. It's the same exact thing as a PO. Um, you'll even see those two terms used interchangeably, but when you hear me use the term WTN, it's the same thing as a, a purchase order. Um, ROG approval. So this is where our business managers and, hang on, I've got more people in the lobby here. Our business managers, our property managers, um, this is where some of your invoices are going to uh, land when they first hit ops. <clears throat> and so this is what's going to happen when you are placing orders through catalogs um, <clears throat> or if you've got an electronic invoice vendor. All of these electronic invoices are going to land in the queue called pending ROG approval. Um, and so it stands for receipt of goods. So this is where you will review the invoices and then you will ROG approve. And then just like with purchasing, each of you is going to have a spend limit and a budget limit. And depending on those limits, will determine whether or not someone else needs to approve it. Um, for orders, Carmen uh, is going to be the final approver for all orders. So she will be reviewing all orders before they're actually released, if you will. Um, for invoices, 
<clears throat> your AP coordinator is going to be the final approver for invoices because all invoices, once they're fully approved, are going to push over into your accounting system, just like they do today. So your AP coordinator is going to be the final approver on those. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about the different types of orders, we've got online orders and offline orders. Um, an online order is an order placed through a catalog. So you guys are going to have the same catalogs in ops that you do in purchasing. So you're going to see HD Supply, Sherwin-Williams, the Home Depot Pro, Maintenance Supply Headquarters. If you've got those catalogs in purchasing, they are going to move over to ops. And in fact, some of you may be seeing now that some of those catalogs have disappeared from purchasing. And so as you are clearing out your dashboards in purchasing, we're closing off all of your accounts with those vendors and then moving them over into ops. So we're hoping that it's going to be a relatively seamless transition for you and that when you do start using ops in earnest, which is going to be on Monday, that you'll have all the catalogs available to you. All right, so online order is placed through a catalog. Offline order, so if you are placing an order for, say, a service and there is no there is no catalog available, and then you will create what we call an offline order. And one second, guys, let me mute everyone. You'll create an offline order. So we will go through that process today too. So same thing with the offline orders, same spend limits, same budget limits, same kind of thing. Workflow approval is what I alluded to just a minute ago when I said that if an order exceeds your spend and budget limitations, then it's going to require additional approval. So it will move on up the chain to your regional manager and whoever else needs to approve it. If you're a maintenance supervisor, it will have to go to your property manager first and then from the property manager to the regional manager, et cetera. All right. And then vendor types, which you all are already familiar with, so I don't have to explain a lot of that to you. Um, you've got your catalog vendors, which I've already mentioned. Um, E-invoice vendors, same thing. You've got those in purchasing as well. So these are vendors who don't have catalogs, but they will send electronic invoices to ops. And then the last kind of vendor is just the paper vendor. So we know we've got those, we all call them kind of mom and pops a lot of times, or just vendors who do not participate in ops. And so they're going to continue sending those paper invoices. And you guys are going to be creating invoices in ops, and that'll be tomorrow's training. Um, <clears throat> and so you'll be uploading a PDF copy of that invoice and then creating an invoice from orders. All right. So that's kind of the different terminology that you'll be hearing over the next couple of days. So what I'd like to do now is go ahead and just kind of get into the dashboard so you can see what all of you all are going to be seeing. This is your home page, your dashboard, your today page. It's all the same thing. So on this, and I'm just going to quickly go over this, uh, as you're going in here, um, on the top left, you'll see it says Spend Management. Ops Technologies' full name is Ops Technology Spend Management. So that's what you're going to see up here at the top of the page. Something super important that I'm really going to emphasize when we start placing orders or even creating invoices, you'll notice right here that there is a property name here. This is your default property. So many of you oversee more than one property. And so it's really important as you're going through this process, this is the property that you're going to be creating the invoice or the order for. OK, so in this case, I'm at Aliquippa Terrace 1. If you're going to create it for another property, you would simply change your default. And now I'm Aliquippa Terrace 2 you are only going to have visibility to the properties that you oversee. So I'm at the top level right now, I see all properties. But when we start going into the training today, you'll see that I, as a maintenance supervisor or a property manager, um, I only have access to those properties that I oversee. Um, as far as how you're going to get to ops, um, the same way you get over into purchasing and to spend management, um, it's through the unified platform. You will have a new tile that you will have access to. Now, we've not given you access to that just yet, so that's how you're going to get into it, okay? And I'll show you a screenshot of what that looks like toward the end of the training today. 
All right, as we go over through the top part of the dashboard um, up here, I'll get to this part of it, the enter the product name, the, the search bubble here when we get into the catalogs. Um, this little icon here is the vendor marketplace, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this is kind of like the Angie's list of ops technology. Um, so you could click on that if you were looking for a vendor. Maybe you needed a vendor, a, a plumber, and you can search for plumbers in your area. And this is a like a directory of all vendors that participate with any kind of application that real page um, uses that across all of our products. So accounting, um, ops technology, vendor credentialing, so all of those involve vendors and so we have now this directory of hundreds of thousands of vendors out here in the vendor marketplace the little home icon will bring you right back to this home page shopping cart we'll get into when we start going through the actual catalog orders and then up here at the top and i'm just going to quickly change my logged in user so i can show you this functionality up here at the top you'll see when you do log in um, it will have your um, your role and your name up here at the top and a couple of things i want to point out to you in here do you notice it says change out of office if you are going to be out of office this is a really nice tool for you to have. So let's just say that your maintenance supervisor creates an order, but you're going to be on vacation. And so what's going to happen is if the order exceeds your maintenance supervisor's spend and budget limits, then it needs additional approval. And so if you don't set your out of office, that order is going to come up and sit in your bucket. Now, each of you also has a limited amount of time to approve orders and invoices. So even if this order comes and sits up in your approval bucket, that time limit will then, once that time expires, it will push it up to the next person in the workflow. However, if you set your out of office, then the system is going to see that and it's going to automatically skip you and go to the next user. So in other words, in my example, the maintenance supervisor created an order, you've set your out of office as the property manager, when the order routes up to the property manager, the system recognizes that you're out of your office and it will automatically skip you and route to your regional manager. All right, so it will automatically turn off when you are um, back in the office. If you come back early, you can just simply change it. All right, uh, another thing here, remember I showed you up here at the top, your default property. So this was in my training environment, training property one, it'll be the same thing here. And then in here, as far as things like just the aesthetics, how do you like things to look? The navigation, you may be already familiar with this. Um, just watch over here on the far left when I change it to turn off the dark navigation. All it does is change the background. So again, this is just personal preference. And then there's your logout. Um, <clears throat> a little bit about what you're seeing here. You'll notice it says dashboard reflects. And so these are the properties that you oversee. So it could be um, we have regional managers. So it'll say regional, you know, Mary Smith, and you will have access to all of those properties. You can change your dashboard. So right now I'm seeing all three properties, data from all three properties. If I only wanted to see from training property one, I would change it. And it would look like this, maybe training property two, and you'll see how things change. Nothing there. All right. So it's just, again, personal preference. How do you want your dashboard to look? And you can customize it like that. Over, <clears throat> over here on the left side, I'm not going to get into a lot of details about this, but this little price tag is your storefront. So this is the same thing that you guys had in purchasing. This is where your catalogs live. We'll go into that in just a few minutes. Um, this is orders. <clears throat> so everything related to orders in here, order summary, your um, creating offline orders, which we will do later. We can even create recurring orders. And then here's invoices, the invoice summary. Um, creating offline invoices. Again, we're going to go into these things. You're not going to have to worry about any of these approvals because this is the same thing right here. If you have something to approve, it is going to show right here on your dashboard for you. 
One thing I do want to familiarize you all with is the vendors, the way we have them set up. Now, this is a training environment. This isn't your live environment, so it's just a little bit different looking um, as far as the number of online vendors. But let me just show you. You notice you have a company vendor directory and a property vendor directory. The company vendor directory is all vendors for Corker and Jenison. Corker and Jenison also uses something in accounting called restrictions. So they, they have the ability to create a new vendor and restrict it so that only certain properties have visibility to that vendor. So it could be that training property one has visibility to 1500 vendors, but training property two only has visibility to 1400. So when you're looking at your company vendor directory, you're gonna see all vendors. Now, the system always defaults to your online vendors. So remember I told you online vendors are either catalog or e-invoice. So you're gonna see those first, always. But to see all vendors, you simply use this filter and in every single summary screen on ops, there is this filter available to you to open up so that you can change your filter information and notice that it's defaulted to online. If I want to see online and offline, I simply select that and now I can see I've got 1300 vendors available to me. So that's at the company level. At the property level, same thing, we're going to see your online vendors first and then we'll switch to online and offline and you may have a different number than we saw at the company level maybe not in the training environment i think i just copied them all over but notice yeah there's 1311 in here all right so it's a little bit different so that's the difference but this is how you see your vendors just go to the company vendor directory or your property vendor directory open up the filters select online and offline and that way you can see all of the vendors all right the next thing is with setup you all are not going to be doing anything in setup we do have some reports available to you we have some ops buyer reports it's super helpful this will be something that we will get more in detail with as we um, <clears throat> go on for the next few weeks your account manager and this is the other nice thing about ops is that you are assigned a dedicated account manager and it's Claudia Gelia, and she is on the call with us today. And so over the next few weeks, she will start conducting boot camp calls once a week for about an hour, and she'll go over a different topic every week. And so one of the weeks may be going over the ops buyer reports to familiarize you with those reports out there. So make sure when you start getting the invitations for the boot camps, make sure you attend those. All right. All right, and last but not least, we've got help and we've got online help and <clears throat> it's actually quite helpful. <laughs> so you can actually come in here just like you do with any other online help, search by topic, search for your topic, and then it will pop up with the answer for you. Okay, the responses for you. The other thing I wanna point out to you, down here, um, more so in your live environment, you're going to see on the lower left hand side spend management updates and you're going to see um, where we have uh, the websites, we have training material, we have releases. And so in here on the training material, you're going to see an entire welcome guide. And this also has all kinds of information for you, including some how-to documents as we start scrolling down here. So you can see all these how-tos that are available to you. So you'll be able to come in here, you can actually link to the, the document itself. And then you can, if you wanted to, save that document to your, um, your own internal file. Okay, all right. So what I wanna do now is go ahead and get started. And what we're gonna start with is reviewing the uh, shopping process as though you're shopping from catalogs, what we call online shopping. So as I showed you earlier, and I'm going to log in as a maintenance supervisor, and you all have different 
limits um, and your roles in ops are going to reflect that. So when you see maintenance supervisor 500, that means that maintenance supervisor has a $500 spend. Um, property manager 2,500, that means the property manager has a $2,500 spend. So that's kind of how those titles and those roles um, play into all of your spend limits in here. So I'm logged in as a maintenance supervisor 500. I've set my default property to training property one. Now, one thing to keep in mind, I know a lot of you will be splitting, which is fine. So when you start going through the process, just select whatever default property that is going to be included in that split. And then as you're going through the process, the checkout process, you'll be able to go in and split those orders. So I've got my default set to training property one, and I'm gonna go into the catalogs, into the storefront. So let's go ahead and go there. And I know all of you all are already familiar with the different types of catalogs. So we've got the punch out catalogs where you punch out. In this case, you see that staples is a punch out catalog. So when you select staples, you will punch out to staples.com. So that should be nothing new to you. It looks very familiar. You know, you add in your items from staples. You put those in your staples shopping cart and then from there you um, check out, you come back into ops, and then in ops is where you're going to be doing things like inserting the GL code or inserting a unit number. So things like that that you'll be doing uh, in ops. And then we have what we call our ops hosted catalogs. And in this environment, it's Acme, HD, and Sherwin-Williams. So that's obviously one way that you can shop. Another way that you can shop is by specific SKU number. So if you um, know your SKUs, you want to just find them by typing them in. You can do that right here. You can also shop by category. So we have categories down here that you can see appliances, electrical. So what is going to happen there is that these categories are going to look all across the ops hosted catalogs, not across the punch out. So if you were looking for appliances and you wanted to search for appliances across Acme and HD Supply, you can you can select the category. And once you do that, on this left side, you're going to see yet more filters. So what we can see here is we've got our category of appliances. I can see, and I'll enlarge this a little bit for you, that we came back with results from two different suppliers, HD Supply and Acme Supply. You can filter by price, you can filter by brand, and then up here at the top, you can sort by the product, the brand, the supplier, and the price. All right, so different ways that you can sort in there as well. You can even change your view from a row view or a list view to a grid view. And it's just, again, this is personal preference. So this is where I'd be able to do, if I wanted to do maybe some comparison shopping, maybe I was looking for, you know, ironing boards and maybe both Acme and HD have ironing boards. And so I just want to find the one that is the least expensive. This would give me the ability to do that. So that's what shopping by category does for you. And then as you guys start gaining some history in here and you, place your orders over time, what's going to happen is Ops is going to store all of your catalog purchases in this frequent purchases section. And so over time, you're going to start having more and more items down here, and it will show you a picture of each of the items that you've ordered over time. And the nice thing here on this view list at the very end, if you select that, you can see here's the product, the light fixture, you can see the SKU number, but over here on the far right, the frequency, it tells you how many times you've ordered this product. So this comes in really handy when maybe you have kind of a um, an odd uh, product that you use on site that you maybe only order every six months. If you ordered it from a catalog, this gives you the ability to find it easily. And then from here, notice you can just add it to your cart. So we have multiple ways for you to use the online shopping. One other way I want to show you, and this relates back to 
the actual SKU. So I'm going to go ahead and go through the process of um, placing an order for some things. So I mentioned to you, let's go ahead and punch out to Staples. And I'm not sure if online, if it makes you enter your zip code or not. But then you just come out to Staples like you guys are very familiar with. You find whatever products you need to look for. So today we'll look for some cleaning supplies. And we'll go with the cleaners and we'll just add some items to our shopping cart. And we'll add this. that so etc cetera, etc cetera, as you're doing this okay so as i'm doing that you'll notice that my staple shopping cart has three items in it so i'm finished shopping at staples i want to go ahead review and check out so i can see the three items that i've got in my staple shopping cart and i'm going to submit the order now all we're doing now it's going to bring you back into ops you're going to see these three little dots or these little dots come back in. And now in our ops shopping cart, there are those three items. All right, um, let's go ahead and shop by one of the vendor catalogs. So let's go specifically to HD supply. So here's what I was showing you a few minutes ago. There's all the different categories. You can see that we got a total of 25,000 items, but let's go ahead and let's just look for some appliances. Now, mind you, these are Corcoran Jenison product, Corcoran Jenison pricing, and just so you all know, all of the delivery um, policies remain the same. So if you place your order by three o'clock today, now keep in mind, you place your order by three o'clock, but it all has to be approved. So you may have placed the order by three o'clock, but maybe it's uh, routed up to your regional manager. And so once that order is fully approved, then that's when the clock starts ticking. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So in here, I'm gonna go ahead and go into my kitchen. And I'm going to order a refrigerator. And in fact, I'm going to order two. So I'll go ahead, add that to cart. And you'll see as I'm adding these things to my cart, the number of items in my cart increases. Go ahead, go back to kitchen, go to dishwasher. And I'll also get two dishwashers. All right, so it's just that simple. And I know it's something that you all are already very, very familiar with. Um, I had also mentioned shopping by SKU. So this is where you can look for those items um, in the search screen. So <clears throat> if I wanted to find a particular faucet and I knew that the SKU number was 422604, I can select search and it will bring up just that one item and I can add it to my cart from there. Another way you guys can do this, if this is the kind of the way that you like to shop, and I, I remember just so you know my my history, I used to be in purchasing and I worked for two different property management companies where we deployed ops and I would go and I'd train um, <clears throat> all of the sites. And I remember working with some of the maintenance supervisors and a lot of times they would have that Home Depot catalog open and they would just have in front of them, they would have just like a notepad. And this is essentially the same thing as having that notepad in front of you. So if I knew the SKUs that I wanted to order and I wanted to order these particular items, I can enter them all. Quantity, skew, quantity, skew, et cetera, et cetera. And then I select find products and it finds all four of those products for me. And then from here, I can add them all to my cart at one time. So that's kind of a nice quick step for you guys. All right, let me make sure I'm covering everything. I'm trying to follow my. All right, so let's go into now our shopping cart. I've got all of my items in my shopping cart. You know what I'm gonna do? Let me 
do one other thing here. I want to go ahead and add something from Sherwin Williams because I don't know exactly how the purchasing shopping carts work, but as far as ops goes, this is like shopping in the Amazon marketplace. So we already have something in there from Staples. We have something in there from HD Supply. So I'm just going to go ahead now and add one more thing from Sherwin Williams. Let's just go ahead and get some paint. And I'll go to paint and stains. And then I'm just going to get some of this Promar 400 and I'll add that to my shopping cart as well. So now we've got items from three different vendors in our shopping cart. I've got everything I need to order for the day. Um, so now I want to go over some of the features of the shopping cart itself. So when you first click on it, you're just going to see this in like a, a list view here. If you want to view the full cart, this is where you'll be able to do things like update your quantities, um, remove items, and create custom shopping lists, which I'm going to strongly encourage you guys to do this. Um, so now I've got all of the items. I can see every one of them in here. And so now what I want to do is go through some of the features of the actual shopping cart itself. Um, update quantity. So if I wanted to change the quantity of, say, these lights down here, the light fixture and the ceiling fan, I just simply change that to a two, whatever quantity I need, and update quantity and the system will confirm that those quantities have been updated and I can see right here this has been updated and this has as well. Um, the little X over here will remove the quantities or the, the entire item excuse me so that's how you'll be able to do that. I'm going to change these quantities just real quickly so I can show you something else here. The other thing I want to point out to you is notice over here on the far left far right excuse me um, there is a split button which is available only when you have quantities of more than one. This is not splitting across properties. This is splitting quantities. So let's just pretend for a moment that I'm only ordering items for training property one. And when I get to the next page, I know that I'm going to have to enter a GL code and possibly a unit number. Sometimes you're going to be required to enter a unit number, sometimes not. It does not hurt one thing. We've loaded all of your unit numbers in ops, so they're all going to be available to you. And so let's just say on the, um, the dishwasher. I know one of them is going into unit 101 and the other one's going into unit 102. When I get to the next page, and let me just show you real quickly. Right now, you can see that on the dishwasher, I've got two of them and they're on the same line. And here's the unit number box right here. Well, I can't put two unit numbers in here. So the way you do that then is if you know that that's what you need to do as far as applying them to the different unit numbers is you will simply come over to your split, select split and you say, I wanna split this into two line items. Oops. And then you submit. And so now <clears throat> you've got one dishwasher here and the other one has, it's fallen off the page, but it is there. So when I get to the next screen where I have to enter the unit number, <clears throat> I will be able to assign one to unit 101 and one to unit 102. So that's the purpose of that split. Um, the save cart button, I do wanna point this out to you only because I'm gonna save you some frustration. Um, the purpose of this is while you're in ops, as long as you're active in ops, it's not going to sign you out. However, if you are inactive for two hours, the system is going to log you out. So let's just say you came in first thing in the morning and you had 25 items in your shopping cart and you get called away for an emergency and you're gone for over two hours. If you did not remember to save your cart when you come back and log back in, you're not going to be happy because all of your shopping cart is going to be empty and you'll have to start over. So if you'll just remember to save your cart, then that's going to save you some frustration. When you log back in, you'll be able to go back into your cart and everything will be there. Um, <clears throat> next thing I want to show you guys is the ability to create shopping lists. And these shopping lists are specific to whatever property 
that you are set to as your default. So let me just show you how to do that. It's super simple. Um, let's just say that for, um, I want to create an appliances shopping list. So I'm going to select my refrigerator and my dishwasher, and I am going to add to list. When I do that, it's going to, the system is going to pop up with a list of all of my custom shopping lists. So you can see I've already got one <clears throat> that says golf carts. Well, right now the system thinks I want to add those two appliances to my golf carts. Well, I don't. I want to create a brand new um, shopping list. So I'm going to put my cursor in this radial button <clears throat> and create a brand new shopping list called appliances. And then I'm just going to say choose. So now in the future, when I want to order those same two appliances, I simply go to shopping lists, find appliances, and then I can add <clears throat> these two appliances in these two quantities. Now, mind you, you can change the quantities and notice you can add all to cart. So you can add all at one time. So this is a real time saver. So think about all the different shopping lists you could create. It applies to not only ops hosted catalogs, but also to your punch out catalogs. So you could create a um, office supplies, you got appliances, lighting. It, I mean, it's kind of endless as to what you could do, but it's a really big time saver. So I'm just going to encourage all of you to, to take advantage of that because it is a time saver. All right, at this point, I've got everything in my shopping cart that I need to order. And so from here, I am going to go to proceed to checkout. Now, this is where I showed you a minute ago, you're required to enter a GL code. You cannot leave this page without entering a GL code. Now, for those of you who are a little concerned that, well, you know, what is the GL code? Um, remember that Carmen is going to be reviewing all orders before they go through, so she will be reviewing these, but we do have some ways to kind of help you as far as um, narrowing down your choices, if you will. The other thing that's going to happen eventually is your corporate team is working on a mapping. So if you'll notice, and I, I think what I did is I unintentionally mapped a couple of things, um, but what will happen is when that mapping is completed and we upload it, then you'll see these fields auto-populate in some places. So that'll be a really nice tool for you all not to have to worry about the GLs, but I am going to show you how that works as well. So let's just go one by one and let's go over to the GL code field and you can also use keywords to find the appropriate GL code. So in this case, we know that the dishwasher is an appliance. Now, if you do have a specific GL code for dishwashers, you could type in dishwasher and hit the tab key and it will bring up only GL codes that whose description contains dishwasher. And in this case, none of them do. So let me go ahead and cancel out of here. Well, how about appliances? And sometimes guys, if you type in just a partial word, that's probably better because it might say in the description appliance, or it might say appliances. So remember the tab key. All right, so type that in. So now I've only got five GL codes to choose from. So that makes it a lot easier for me. I can see that I've got my CapEx codes, I've got my expense codes. So in this case, I'm just going to change this or uh, select the 6544-015. Know too that you can copy paste. So if I wanted to copy, that GL code and take it down and I want to put it also in this dishwasher field. And I want to put it in with the refrigerator as well. I can do that. Now, one thing I do want to forewarn you for those of you who are going to be splitting across properties. I'm going to show you how to do the split now because you'll want to do the splits before you enter the GL codes because when you do a split, the system is going to wipe out any GL codes you had for that line. So let me just show you how that works. All right, so let's just say I want to split. Um, I'm going to come down here to the refrigerator and I oversee training property one, two, and three. 
and I want to split this between my uh, two of my properties. So let me show you how this works. When you select this split, and remember the previous page, the split was just for quantities. This is for properties. When I split here, the system brings up a little screen that allows you to do different types of splits. Now, for those of you who have the allocations, we've entered those allocations in there as ratios. And I'm going to show you the difference between the allocation by unit count and a true allocation. So the allocation for those of you who use, um, there's one I know for one of the groups of properties related to snow removal. So that is a little bit different from the uh, unit count ratios. All right, so in this case, what I'm going to do is actually split by quantity. The first thing I wanna do is add more lines. And I know I'm splitting between property one and property two. I'm going to change my split by to quantity and make this a one and this a one, and then I will calculate. All right, so I can see now that I have split this and I'll select OK. And so now you can see that I've got one refrigerator here for training property one, and the other one is up here for training property two. Now in this case, it did actually retain my GL codes. Um, a lot of times what it's going to do is it's going to wipe out the GL codes. So that's why I said whenever you're doing this, make sure that you split um, split the um, the line items first before you um, actually go in and put in all those GL codes. Okay. Um, now I do want to show you too. Remember when we came to this page, you saw a couple of the GL codes were already auto populated. That's going to ultimately be a, a nice tool for you all and it'd be available to you. Um, so let me just show you how that works as well. So you came in and we see that we've got um, the paint that automatically coded to 6561-0001. You can always determine if there's more codes available to you. So you just simply remove that, use your percent sign. Remember this percent sign and take a note of this. Percent sign is your wildcard. So percent sign, tab key, and then it will show you all of the other GLs that were mapped. In this case, that one was the only one and it came through. And so now you can choose from any GL in the chart of accounts. So that's what the um, percent sign will also do. It will bring up all of the GL codes that are available to you. Okay, so just remember that that is your, your um, default. Um, if you know the GL code, absolutely go ahead and enter it. Um, remember too, you've got, you can use your default here. I'm sorry, your um, keyword, and you can enter that there as well. All right, so as I mentioned, for each one of these, the geo code's required. So let me go ahead and start putting those in. So we've got lighting, and on this one, the lighting probably also applies to, let's go down to the ceiling fan, and anything else here? I don't think so. And then let's go into, I don't know if there's actually a sink, but I'm going to go into plumbing. So again, notice that I'm just typing in a partial word plumb. Hit the tab key. This brings up only those of GL codes whose description contains the word plumbing. So let's go to plumbing supplies. All right, and go on down. And for the rest of these, I'm going to say that these are office supplies. And so let's just go into office expenses and then copy paste all the way down here. Okay, now this is, you'll notice the next column is the unit number. Now, if any of these, and I'm going to just real quickly, I'm going to code something to a GL that I can show you how this works. So let me find something for you guys really quickly here. All right, what I want to show you is 
if a unit number is required, and so let me code one of these to something that makes OK, so we will code this to. Oh, I got lucky. All right, so this is one of them. I'm going to remove this geo code here on the refrigerator. I just forgot to enter it in. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'll put it in. My apologies. Let me go ahead and put it back. Because we were talking about unit numbers. Um, if a unit number is required, when I get to the part where I've got all my geo codes in here and Notice too, guys, there is a tax exempt. If you know that the item is tax exempt, you can check this box too. That's available to you to be able to use. Now back to my unit numbers. Um, I've got all my geo codes in here. And so now I want to go ahead and review my order because ops doing this shopping online is kind of a three step process. You start in your shopping cart then you go to the review page and then the final page. What it's going to do is it's going to take all the items from every vendor that you have um, products for and it's going to create a separate remember, WTN or PO for each of them. So I think I'm all ready to go. I want to check my budget because Ops is going to do a budget check for you and where you see the red that means you're over budget. OK, so just know that that could cause your order to need additional approval. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and review my order now in this case, just so you guys know a unit number is required when you're using this particular geo code for appliances. When I click review your order, the system's going to tell me, nope, you got to enter a unit number. And so when I select OK, it's going to put my cursor in the field where I need to put the unit number, which is right here. And so in this case, I know that I can use my percent sign tab key to see all units. And of course, you guys know your unit numbers. So I'm going to put this one in unit number 101. And I think again, I'm done. But you know what? No, every time that there is a unit number required, the system's going to stop you. OK, so let me go ahead and put in 102. Whoops, 102. And I know now that, OK, yeah, if I needed a unit number for those other two appliances, I'm going to need it for this one as well. So let's go ahead and enter this. And this one will be 102. All right, I'm going to go ahead now and I'm going to review my order. And the system is going to do a price and availability check before it gets to this page. It's ensuring that the pricing is correct and everything is available. If it's not available, you will see up at the top a banner that says that the item is on back order and you have the ability to either accept the back order or go back in, edit your cart, remove the item, perhaps order it from someone else. All right, so you'll be able to do that. Um, but now you can see that I've got an order in here for Staples, an order for Sherwin-Williams, and an order for HD Supply. This is my last opportunity to make any kind of changes that I need to make. So if I need to go back and edit, I would edit here, but we'll just say that everything looks good. And so from here, I'm just going to go ahead and submit my order. Now remember, I am a maintenance supervisor. I have a $500 spend limit. The Staples order is only $63. The Sherwin-Williams order is only $137.82. And the Home Depot order is $1,700. So let me just show you what's going to happen when we get to this Submit My Order. All right. So it's going to come back and tell you that your order is going to be in Pending workflow approval. And the reason you are always, always going to see pending workflow approval is because at the very least, Carmen has to review your order before it's released. So somebody has to approve this. It could be that let's take a look. Let's look at the Staples order. So when we look at the Staples order, this is great information, guys. At the bottom of every order, and every invoice, when we talk about invoices tomorrow, there is additional information right here. Open that up and you can see on this one that 
it's pending workflow approval with the controller. That's Carmen. So this order made it all the way through. It didn't need additional approval from my property manager or my regional, but Carmen has to review it first. So it is in pending workflow approval. All right, so that means that it still needs to have additional approval. It's not approved yet. If we go back, so now what I wanna show you is you'll have to go to your orders and go to order summary screen. And let's take a look at the HD supply order. Now here's that big order. Scroll down to the bottom, additional information. And you can see in this case, because this exceeded my spend limit, my property manager is next in line to approve it. Okay, so that's how you can tell who it's pending approval with. Another way you can tell, so remember I'm maintenance supervisor 500, I go back to my today page. Notice in pending approvals, I don't have anything to approve. There's nothing in my bucket here because this is set to mine, meaning these are my approvals. But if I change this to all, I see all of the items and whoever within my approval workflow is in there that needs to approve. So there's six orders that need approval from someone. And if I click on this little carrot here, I can see that my property manager has three orders to approve and my controller has three orders to approve. All right, so that's how you can tell. Um, the, the beauty of this is that um, once the catalog orders are fully approved, then the orders are going to go directly to the vendors, just like they do now with you guys with purchasing. So once Carmen approves those orders, then it will go directly to HD Supply, Sherwin-Williams, Office Depot, you know, whoever the vendor is, and you do nothing. All right. So that's as far as the order, um, for as far as the online orders for the catalogs. That's pretty much it. I do want to show you one other thing. So let's go to our order summary screen. And we'll go to HD supply. Just I'm going to choose one. And again, down here at the bottom, this is really great stuff down here. You guys can actually attach something. So let's just say you were ordering this one of the refrigerators because the resident had damaged it and you took a picture of it. And so you want to add an attachment. So under more actions, you can attach file. So if you saved it as a PDF or a JPEG, um, you'll be able to attach it here. You just simply go through your browser, select it, and I'm just gonna pick something really quickly from mine if I can find a quick PDF. All right, I'll attach my file, I'll say okay. And then down here at the bottom now, there it is. I can attach it. If I need to remove it, I can do that as well. All right, I mean, somebody's knocking on the door here. All right, one other thing, under more actions, you do have the ability to void. So if you realize, oh, I don't need to order this, some of you will have the ability to void, some won't. It is a permission based, so based on the role. Um, so some of you will have this, some of you won't, um, but there's other things you can do in here as well, print to PDF. Um, the email, um, this has nothing to do with the vendor. Do not use this email to email it to the vendor, okay? This is purely if you wanted to email it to say your regional for some reason and you wanted them to see this. That's what that's for, okay? All right. That pretty well covers it for the um, ordering from a catalog. So now we're at a point where we're going to do our first exercise here. So each of you is going to have a login into the training environment. This is what always takes forever. So I'm going to pull up the everyone's logins and get them over here on the screen so you can see them. So I know this takes a little while because not everyone has dual monitors like I do. So what we want you to do in order to participate is go to demomarket.realpage.com. When you get there, you should see a screen that looks just like this over here on the right. 
I've got all of your logins on this screen. You're looking for your username and your password. So just so you know, your username is first initial last name dot CJM. So if your name's Mary Smith, it's M Smith dot CJM. Everything's in lower case. Everyone's passwords are welcome one. So let everyone take a minute. Oh, I did. If your last name is O'Brien, O'Hara, or O'Rourke, um, there is no um, apostrophe after the O. And then some of them, um, Jill, I shortened yours. Um, so it's not McGregor Barris, it's just Barris. Um, so a little bit different, but these are all your logins. Um, Jill and Kennedy, you will be logged in as super users. So anything you do will not require any kind of approval. But if you want to go through the steps, through the motions of doing this. Um, Carmen, I'm not sure. I think you can create orders. Um, I'm not 100% sure. Um, so I've you're in here as your controller as well. And uh, so, just for anybody who's having trouble getting there, I put the link in the chat here. In our thank teams. you. So I'll give everyone a minute or two. To get logged in. And if you can't get in. Let me know. No, they will not. So um, Kelly's asking if your open POs will carry over, they will not. So what you guys need to do um, for the rest of the week is work on cleaning out your purchasing dashboard um, and getting those cleared out. Um, if you do have open orders, uh, you should still be receiving invoices. Now, just so you know, purchasing, it's not being completely shut down. So, um, if you uh, if you have items out there that you have open orders and you're waiting invoices, you'll still be able to get all that closed out. But we will be moving over all of the um, catalogs and e-invoices to ops officially on Friday. Um, the appliances will require a unit number if you're using that GL code that I showed you. So um, the, the GL codes are what drives the unit number requirement. So if you're doing HVAC appliances, carpet and flooring, cabinets, uh, let's see some of the other ones. Uh, HVC uh, unit conversions. That's primarily what it is. So if you're doing using any of the geo codes um, that are associated with those items, Um, in addition to your actual units, we have three kind of catch all units, common office and stock. So you'll be able to select those as well. So back to that appliance question, if you're putting one in stock, then you can just select the unit stock. OK, Janet, I think that should answer your question. And then Kelly, as far as your open POs, um, Let me talk to Jill and Carmen and Kennedy about how we want to handle where you've got the vendors have been contracted, but the work's not completed or invoiced. Um, I don't think you're going to want to enter that into ops. I think we're going to start clean in ops. All right, I'm hoping everyone, yes, all of the vendor codes are identical. Everything is the same. So it's the same vendor codes you've been using. None of that changes. 
All right, I'm assuming that everyone's in since I haven't heard. I'm going to take down this and I'm going to put up your first assignment here. So again, for you guys, this is nothing new to you, uh, so I don't think you're going to have too much trouble with this. I just want you to get a good feel for how ops functions. OK, so let me go ahead now and I'm going to leave this up on the screen. And this is your first in class. Exercise here. So we're going to have you create some catalog orders um, for those of you who do oversee more than one property. When you get down to um, the step where I'm talking about splitting between properties, so down here, then you'll be able to do that. If you do not oversee more than one property, you can just disregard that. All right, I'm going to put myself on mute. I'm going to take a quick break, and I tell you what, uh, let me give you a time for this. So it is. 34 after the hour. Um, it shouldn't take you more than say, uh, I'm going to give you these 34. I'm, I'm going to give you 11 minutes for this. OK, so at 45 after the hour, you should have that all taken care of. And um, if you need to take a break, then then we will come. We will um, rejoin at 45 after the hour. Do we have to split manually each time of splitting between properties? So Eric, um, yes, you have to select that split button. There's also a split all. So if you are splitting every single thing on your order, you'll be able to use the split all button. And then you can do it one time and it will automatically split all line items. All right, we will reconvene at 45 after. And if you have any questions, uh, put them in the chat. I'm going to take a really quick break myself. I'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you.
Okay, we, <clears throat> we've got about one minute. Um, let me know if you all need more time to finish things up. Just put it in the chat, need more time, and I'll give you a few more minutes. Thanks, Leslie. Welcome back. <laughs> Thanks. I've been back for a little while. I just had myself muted. Nice little mute break. All right, I didn't see anything in the chat about anybody needing more time. Did you all ace through this? Pretty simple, especially if you are already familiar with ordering from catalogs. All right, OK. We I will give you more time. How about three more minutes? So it's 45 minutes after at 1048. We'll reconvene. Leslie, do you see Janet in the chat? Is, do you think we can help her out with her staples order? Uh, yeah, so Janet, um, all you need to do is it, it could be that maybe you didn't completely check out of staples. So um, just go back to and click on that staples, that icon that'll punch you out to the staples catalog. Add the, the paper, you can pick anything you want, quite frankly. Um, and if you just want to add one item, that's fine. Um, then you're going to review your cart in Staples and then submit that. And it should bring you back into Ops where you have that item in your Ops shopping cart. And I can, while we're doing this, let me take a look. Sorry, guys, I'll get this off. And I'll be happy to go over <clears throat> that. So, just a, not another minute, guys. Okay, Janet, we'll take a look at that. Um, if you guys didn't get through the exercise, if you want to remember, you can save your cart. And finish up. Later. OK, so in the interest of time, I am going to have to move on. Um, I will just really quickly um, go through that. So to get to. Staples, obviously, you know, you check on. 
the staples icon. And it's prompting me to enter a zip code. And I'm just going to go to my products. I'll find some paper. I'll just put in something. And I'll add this copy paper, which is now in my Staples shopping cart. And I'll go ahead and review and check out. So from here, I'm going to submit my order. I'm still in Staples. And so now I've been brought back into Ops. It gives me a glimpse of what I ordered from Staples, which was the, um, the copy paper. I can close that out and it should be in your Ops shopping cart. Is that Janet and Evelyn? Was that not what you saw? Hmm. All right, let's take a look here. All of you should have the Staples catalog. So let's go back. Um, okay, guys, I'm not sure. I can't really explain why that's not working for you guys. Um, so it should be just fine in your live environment. <clears throat> if you're having problems with it, then we'll we'll definitely want to deal with that. Okay. Um, Rebecca, uh, after splitting a purchase, it clears out all the unit numbers. Remember, I told you guys, um, no, the best practice is you need to split first and then add your GL codes and unit numbers. And the reason being, if you think about it, if you do the split after you've added a unit number, so let's just say we were splitting one line item that was already just test property one or training property one. And then I do a split. I already added the unit number for training property one. And now I'm splitting that across three different properties. Now the system goes, oh, wait, that you may not have the same unit numbers for all three of those properties. So best practice, split first, then add your GL codes and your unit numbers. OK. One other thing, guys, I need to tell you, um, you need to be doing this through Chrome. So if you're doing this through IP or Edge, it's not going to work as well. So if you logged in through I, internet, not the IP, <laughs> if you, IE, if you're logged in through Internet Explorer or R through Edge, it is not going to work as well. You really need to be in Chrome. All right, let's go ahead now. Yeah, um, Judy, I'm not sure why that's well, let's see here. You did set a. I see you set a default property. I. We have flukes every once in a while. We have little gremlins, so I'm not sure why that's happening. OK. But were you able to place orders from for your other items? Outside of um, Office Depot or Staples, excuse me. All right, guys, we're going to move on now to offline orders. All right, so obviously there's going to be a number of your vendors who do not have catalogs and you need to create a PO for them or a WTM. And so for those, you're going to have to create what we call an offline order. So what you'll do is you will start from 
instead of the storefront, you're going to go to orders and then create offline order. And you're going to have a template and we kind of guide you through the steps. Step one, step two, and step three. And in fact, the system is going to auto populate <clears throat> some of the order details for you. But first and foremost, and you'll notice that there's little red asterisks um, in here. These are the required fields. So, you know, you got to select a vendor. First thing you do. Now you can go ahead and type in the vendor name. What I like to do is I just click on this little magnifying glass here. And it's going to bring up in this case, it only displays, I think, um, 10 at a time or something like that. Um, notice that there are 132 pages here, uh, a total of 1,311 vendors that I have a choice of. And so I can start typing in <clears throat> the name of my vendor up here in this box, this box right here, or I can type in the vendor code in this box. So you can do anything you want, but <clears throat> in this case, what we're gonna do is I'm just going to select a vendor for imprint. All right, and we're going to order some, I don't know, brochures. I don't even know if you guys use brochures any longer. Um, so the first thing I've done is selected my vendor. The next thing, the order details. So notice that the system automatically put in the order date and the encumbrance date. And I want to talk a little bit about encumbrance with you because what that is, um, is the, the date that the order is encumbering or hitting your budget. So <clears throat> really important here in that we understand that because that is going to impact your budget checks. And the other thing that's really important is when we start talking about invoices tomorrow, we have to make sure that we're matching up orders and invoices or you're going to get a double whammy on your budget because you're going to have your order encumbering the budget and an invoice encumbering the budget. OK, so encumbrance date is exactly that. It's the date that this is hitting your budget. Notice that you can place an order on hold and you could also have done this with the catalog orders. So if you place an order on hold, say you're just being proactive. Let's just say it's the end of the month and you know you don't really have the budget um, to order these brochures, but you just want to go ahead and get this out of the way. And so you can just place this on hold and I'll go ahead and do this so you can see how this works. Place it on hold. Um, it's not going to, nothing's going to happen as far as pushing it into the workflow. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and push, put this one on hold and enter my line items. So I'm ordering, let's say 25 brochures. And I know that they are, I don't know, $20 each. And then I just add rows as needed. So I'm going to add another row and I'm also going to get um, 25 banners. All right, and I know those are I don't know, $15 each. Okay, so again, notice you've got your split all, okay? And you've got the line item split. So if I wanted to split both of these items between my three properties or between two of my three properties, whatever I need to do, I would use the split all. If I want to just split, if I want to just split a single line item or select line items, I use this, the individual line item split. Okay. So let's just go ahead. I'm going to split the brochures. The banners are all going to be for my own property. I only want to split the brochures. I'll select my split. And in this case, I'm going to split by the ratio. So this is, these are the ratios that were established in the system. This is by unit count. So this is where, for instance, I'm splitting 40%, 20%, 40%, 40%. Um, 40% for uh, property one, 20% for property two, and then 40% for property three. All right, if that's what the splits are. And I've set up the ratios based on what your corporate team has provided me. So I've defaulted to ratio. I'm going to add two more lines. I'm going to calculate. 
All right. My ratio. Oh, this is not. Oh, I have to change my properties. Sorry, I knew that didn't make any sense. OK. Apply the default. Calculate. Now we have it. So now you can see I've got my different ratios in here. And then when I select OK. You can see that it's split. There's property one, property two, property three, and it has split the amounts based on the ratio that is set up in the system. I do want to show you guys something else that you will have access to. I'm going to cancel these splits. Oh, it wiped out all my line items too. All right. Bear in mind, if you cancel the splits, um, it wipes out your line items. That's not good. Was not aware of that. Let me go back in here and make a correction here. And those were 25. And add rows, and we got 25 of those. And there's your pen. Okay. I want to show you one other split in here. So for those of you who have allocations, there's a couple of them. I remember one in particular. It was a snow allocation. If you do have an allocation assigned to you, and you'll know who you are, you're going to select allocation code, and you find the allocation code. So you're going to have to actually start typing in. So if it was snow removal, you can see snow allocation split. There's also a security allocation split, and these are both for Oak Hill. So the rest of you may not have anything like this. So if you want to split, and let's just say I were Oak Hill, and it's all the aliquippus. Now, the only reason I can even see this is because of the level that I'm at here, but that's how the allocation code split works. So for those of you who are on that Oak Hill split, that's how you'll use that. OK, but in this case, I'm going to go back to my splits, go to my ratios, add my lines, change my properties. And then apply the default. And we'll say OK. All right, so same thing that you can do when you're doing the catalog orders as far as the splits go. All right, I've got everything in here that I need. Remember, I am placing this order on hold. All right, I do want to check my budget. I want to have an idea. Oh, shoot, guys, I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, so see, the system stops me. I did not enter any GL codes. Um, one thing I want to point out to you on this one, on the offline orders, is notice at the very top, there is a box where you can enter a GL code that's not associated with the line items. What this will do is it will enable you to enter the GL code one time and it will auto populate the GL code for all line items. So I'm going to type in, I'm going to guess this is related to marketing. And maybe not. Uh, let's see. Anything related to brochures? Nope. All right. Um, I'm not sure what this would be related to. So let's see. All right, I'm just going to say this has something to do with residents. So I'm going to go ahead in this case, and I'm going to say it's for resident services. When I select that GL code, notice all GL codes auto populate. I can do the same thing with the unit number. And by the way, if you'll if you noticed in the catalog orders, you could do the same thing with the unit number. So you could auto populate. So remember, I told you guys you also have not a, not only do you have um, your regular unit numbers, but you also have common office and stock. So maybe I just want to put these all in stock. Or maybe I want to put them all in office. I just type in office, hit enter. It's actually going to bring this up and now it auto populates everything in office. There's that tax exempt button as well that you'll be able to select. OK, so now clearly the system smarter than me. And I'm going to go ahead now and check my budget. And I can see for property one, property two and property three where I stand to budget. I'm not over budget because none of these are red. So that tells me that's great. I'm not over budget. So I'll go ahead and say OK. And then I will save from here. Now, remember, I put this on hold. 
it's not going anywhere. Where it landed, it's on my today page and down here in this other section. So let's talk a little bit about this other section. So you see the on hold orders. You see pending orders, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. I'm really going to harp on this a lot. Um, orders sent to supplier, confirmed by supplier, all this other additional information that you see in here. But here's my on hold order. So let me just say I put in the order, it was on hold. I'm now in a new month. I'm going to go ahead and release that order. I open it up. And from here, I just simply submit the order. Now notice you can edit it. If you wanted to remove the banners, you'd be able to do that. So if you wanted to make any kind of edits to it, you'd be able to delete. If I decided I didn't need those banners after all, I'm going to go ahead and delete those. And then I'll save that. And now all I'm doing is ordering the brochures and I'll submit my order. Now this order does exceed my spend limit. So what should happen is it should go into pending workflow approval for my manager to approve. So you can see it's exceeded my spend limit. And what the system will do this time is it's going to show you a summary of your order. If I come down here and if everything's working correctly, I should see that it's pending workflow approval with the property manager. And that's exactly where it is pending workflow approval with the property manager. Okay. Makes sense to everyone. All right, I want to do um, one more so I can kind of show you um, something that's a little bit different and you are going to have an exercise for this as well. So one thing I want to point out that's really, really important. Um, Remember when we looked at our company vendor directory or our property vendor directory? And let me just show you something really quickly here. Notice that you've got two different, if you will, instances of HD supply. Both of them have the same vendor code. One is in bold and blue, and the other one is not. The one that's in bold and blue is the online version. That means this vendor sends electronic invoices. The other one is not in bold and blue. So keep this in mind when you start creating offline orders for vendors who can send electronic invoices. And I want to show you how that works because this is really, really important. So I want to create an offline order for, remember one of my catalog vendors was Acme Supply. So I looked through their catalog and they didn't have the item that I needed. And so I'm going to create an offline order. What this means is it's not catalog, it's not electronic, it's not going to automatically go over to Acme Supply. I'm going to have to actually call in this order. All right, so in this case, I'm going to create an offline order. I'm looking for Acme. Oh, I've got two of them. Which one do I choose? So remember this, guys, it's really important. Whenever you see two instances, one online and one offline of the same vendor, always choose the online. And here's why, and as silly as this sounds, what's going to happen is even though you call in that order to Acme Supply, because they are a part of ops, they are still going to send an electronic invoice. So you have to match up an electronic invoice with the online version of Acme Supply. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to link up the two. Okay, so really, really important when you do see two instances, one that's bold online, the other that's not bold, it's considered offline, always choose the online. So I'm going to choose Acme Supply, and then I'm just going to come down and order whatever it is that I need to order. I'm going to say HVAC of some sort.
All right, and I believe if I'm not mistaken, this one requires a unit number. And I'm gonna put it in unit number 105. Okay, so again, what I'm showing you here, uh, the example is just make sure it has to do with your selecting the correct vendor. Okay, so just wanna make sure everyone understands that. I'll go ahead and check my budget. Everything looks good. Save. And in this case, there's no additional approval needed, except what you got to remember is that all of your orders should wind up where they are. They have to be approved by Carmen. So you see right here, controller. So it's still in pending workflow approval. And where I want to really harp on some things here now, do not place this order until it's fully approved. Fully approved orders in ops, and as crazy as this sounds, as as confusing as it is, and we all disagree with it, but none of us has any power to change it. A fully approved order in ops goes into pending status. And I know that sounds crazy, but just think about it this way. A pending order is one that is pending receiving the goods or the services and pending the invoice. So that's, if you want to think about it that way, that's the way to think about it. So guys, do not place that order until you see it in pending status, especially those that are the offline where you have to call in the order. Now, if it's an online order through a catalog, you don't have to worry about it. The system will take care of itself. But if it is an offline order, until you see it in here in this bucket, so if you click on pending orders and that HD supply is not there, do not place that order, okay? So best practices to keep in mind there. Okay, guys, um, I'm gonna go ahead and <clears throat> we're gonna move on to the next exercise. So let me bring that up and you're going to create a couple of offline orders. Really simple, and let me kind of minimize. There we go. Well, shoot, don't want to do that. Wrong page. All right, so you're going to create offline orders <clears throat> from your menu. So the menu, how you get there, on your far left over here, go to orders, create offline order. You'll see your steps one, two, three. All right. So let me go ahead and put that back up for you. Um, it is 12 after. I'm going to give you until, I'll tell you what, um, let's use this as kind of an opportunity for you guys to take a little break. And so I'm going to give you until 11, let's, I'm sorry, half past the hour uh, to get this done. Okay, so that way you can get these orders placed. So take a little break. We're doing kind of a lunch and learn. So if you got your lunch, you want to grab your lunch, bring it back to your desk. So we'll reconvene at half past the hour. OK, I will still be here. I'm just going to have myself on mute, but just go ahead, do your exercise, take a break, and then we'll reconvene at half past the hour. Hey, Leslie, um, Johnny is having some trouble logging in. Could you put the logging criteria back up on the screen just so that he can see how he can get in there? This is sorted alphabetically by last name. So you'll go to that link that Kennedy provided. It will take you to this login screen. And then your login is all lowercase, first initial last name, dot CJM. 
password is welcome one. So so Johnny is on here. He's actually Trong Hoon. Mm -hmm. Sorry if I mispronounced that for you, Johnny. But um, so he's under H and he hasn't he's, he's been trying. He sent me a couple of screenshots and it hasn't been getting them in. I'm not sure there's something weird about that. OK, let's see here. All right, let me I'm going to go ahead and minimize that, get it back and let me guys uh, get a screen over here. Maybe there's something wrong with the uh, email. Well, and, and make sure that you're in Chrome. Yeah, I'm in Chrome, yeah. All right, so hang on, let me see. And I'm, I'm not saying that uh, I couldn't have made a typo. So let me see what we got going on here. Okay, I was able to get in as you, so let's. All right, so first of all, are you in Chrome? Yes. Yes. Okay, and then in your browser, uh, go to that demomarket.realpage.com, the, the link that Kennedy provided you. Oh, Kennedy. Oh, so we have to go to the link. Correct. We get to that login page. Uh huh. And guys, when, when you actually go out into the live, you're, you're going to do it from your tile in Unified. Is the link on Microsoft? Uh, the link is in the chat. Chat. Okay. You'll see a chat from Kennedy. Okay. Got it. Okay, it must be the link. The link. Oh, what's the link? Okay. Did you get to the login screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Are you in now? Yes. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.
OK, as far as your vendors go, remember, guys, this is a training environment. OK, it's not going to have all your vendors, so this is just for training purposes. So if you're not seeing something, that's fine. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give you guys actually another five minutes extra. Um, I know we had some people um, had a little bit of trouble getting in, so 35 after the hour is when we'll resume. So finish up the exercise, take a little break, grab your lunch, come back to your desk. So 35 after, we're actually running a little bit ahead of schedule. All right.
Okay, guys, this is your one minute warning. So kind of wrap it up and we will resume training. Um, so all of the vendors that are going to be in your live environment come from your accounting system. So if the vendor is active in accounting, it is going to push over into ops. Um, in vendor compliance, if the vendor has not gone through all its credentialing and been approved uh, and had a vendor code assigned to it, um, once that happens, the vendor code pushes into accounting and then pushes into ops. So if the vendor is not active in compliance depot or vendor credentialing, uh, it likely will not be in ops unless someone has added it manually in accounting. All right, we're going to go ahead and get back to training now. Um, I'm going to just real quickly, I've got to pull everything over to my other screen now. Let me close this out. And come up here, find this guy. There we go. All right. Um, just really quickly again on, on the splits, and I'll just go over that super quick so everyone's clear. Uh, I'm going to create an offline order. Select my vendor. I'm just going to call this test. And we'll say there's five of them. Um, I am right now uh, at Aliquippa. So you know what, guys, I need to get into my own property to make this relevant. Let me get into mine. All right, get offline order. All right, so as far as the splits go, if you select split and you're splitting it between properties, first thing you need to do, add more lines. Am I going to split it between two properties, three properties? Just keep in mind if you're adding your standard ratio, you'll need to select every property that's a part of that ratio. Okay. If you're splitting by quantity, perhaps on this one, I'm splitting um, by, by quantity instead. So I've got to choose my properties. And then with this one, I'm going to switch it over to quantity. And I could make this five and five. I could make it six and four, whatever I wanted to do. If you are doing it indeed by ratio, and it is for all of your properties, you need to add as many lines as you need for your different properties. Make sure then from the drop down, you select your properties, calculate, and then select OK. All right. OK, last thing relative to creating orders, we're going to talk about recurring orders. So I know that you probably have some of these set up in purchasing. You'll have to come out and reset them up in ops. But as you guys know, recurring orders are for things that are same service, same product from the same vendor for approximately the same price on a regular basis. So this usually applies to things like your landscaping, your exterminators. It could even be things like, um, you know, some of your marketing, internet, things like that, that are, like I said, same vendor on a regular schedule, about the same price um, on and providing the same service. So to do that, we go to our orders again and then recurring orders. Now we are not going to have an exercise to do this. So just need to make sure you, you pay attention. This is a little bit different. It's going to look similar to a regular offline order. So I want to create a recurring order. So let me just show you when you first go to recurring orders, Ops is going to list all of your recurring order. Notice this says templates. So the templates are essentially the instructions to Ops to create this recurring order for you in whatever period you are designating. So let's create one. 
So I'm going to set, select Create Recurring Order, and this template should look very familiar to you. Step one, step two, step three, except you'll notice that this box that says this is a recurring order is checked, and there's a little bit more information in here, including the schedule over here. So let's go ahead and I'll just and if you guys kind of want to if you want to practice this um, after we're done, great, go for it. Uh, so all you do, same kind of uh, process relative to your offline orders. I'm going to choose. Let's just see if I can find one that's landscaping. Here we go. Burns landscape. So this is my landscaping company. I know that they bill me and I'm going to just say monthly. OK, and, and then for this example, I know they bill me monthly for all of my landscaping services. And so what I want is to create a single set of instructions so that every month ops will create the order for me. All right, so I've selected my vendor. Order date and encumbrance date obviously already selected as is this is a recurring order. We're going to give this a name. So if you guys remember on the previous page when I selected recurring orders, this is what is going to display on that page. So make sure you give it a title that makes sense to you because you will have the ability to come in, change the schedules. Um, so just a way that you can easily find it. So I'm going to call this um, Burns Monthly Landscaping. Start date and end date. This is your contract period. Now, start date, I want everyone to, to pay attention to this. We can't go back in time, right? We're, we're not going back to January. So if your contract was for this year, um, we're not going to start the date on January 1st because we certainly don't want any orders created in the past. So best practice, guys, is that we always just say start it for the following month if you you probably haven't gotten your or you may have already gotten the um, invoice for this month, but I would say because we're already in a partial month, I would have this start on the first period of the next full month. So that being said, that would be November. And I'm going to say that my contract with Burns goes through December of 2023. So my date range, my start date is going to whoops, I chose the wrong date. Sorry, guys. Is going to be November 1st of 2022 through December 31st of 2023. That's my start and end date. We're going to come over here and we're going to set the schedule. Now think about when you want this order created and best practice is for the order to be in the system and approved before the invoice comes in. So what we always say as a best practice rule of thumb is have the order created on the first day of the month of every month. So in this case, we're going to say the order schedule. We know that we're billed every month. OK, and this should be this is a little confusing. It should say days or date. All right, so. I would not suggest you use the days. What I would suggest is you use the date one. We want this order created every month on the first day of the month. That way, if the invoice comes in on the 15th or the 25th or whenever it does come in, the order has already gone through and been approved. OK, all right. So first day of the month. So in this case, guys, this is a days or dates. OK, so again, best practice have it have the order created on the first day of the month. And we're just right now creating the instructions. So down here, the description is monthly landscaping. And the cost is, say, 1500. The GL code, and again, guys, if you need to split, make sure you split first. If this is being split between, between multiple properties, do your split now. OK, so let me go ahead and in fact, I'll split it. More lines between property one, two and three. I'm going to apply my ratio. 
and then say OK. So now I've got it split and I can use this top GL code box to enter my GL code. And when I do this, it'll auto populate all of these boxes. Very likely there is no unit number required for this. If you're really into putting in your unit numbers, this would be common. So you could put in common if you so desired. All right, so now I have got my schedule set up. So let me go ahead and save. Now this is not going through workflow because this is strictly instructions. This is the template. So I'm going to save this. You can review it now. Notice that there's nothing as far as additional information. It's not being routed anywhere. It's not going through workflow. But now if I go to orders, recurring orders, there it is. If I needed to make changes to it, I can come in here and up. So I can uh, change my start and end date. Maybe toward the end of this year, they came back, they negotiated with me and they said, hey, we'll, we'll offer these prices through the end of 2024. Just change your date here. That's all you have to do. If you decide if they say, you know what? Um, we're going to start billing you on a quarterly basis. You can actually set up a quarterly billing in here. So now instead of every month, they're saying, oh, we're going to bill you quarterly. So the other months would be, let's just say three, six, nine, 12, whatever changes you need to make. All right. And then you can change them. You can then select update. Notice down here, if you fire burns as your uh, landscaping service, then you just select the canceled and it will completely remove that. It'll show it as um, disabled, I believe. Okay, so that's where your recurring orders are. It's really simple. Um, does anybody want me to go through that again? Or does anybody have questions about recurring orders before we get into order approvals? And remember this that you see here on this page is simply your list of all of your templates and within the templates are the instructions. So in the case of the Burns one, what's going to happen is Ops is going to create for you on November 1st an offline order split between these three properties and these amounts here, 600, 375, 525, and that order then will have to be approved. So just keep in mind that it's going to indicate that it was in this case, it was created by the property manager. And if this is within the property manager spend and budget limits, it won't need any additional approval. If it's outside of the spend and budget limits, it will have to route up to the regional. And then ultimately, guys, remember, Carmen is going to approve every single order. All right. No questions. All right. So all of these orders that we've created this morning, um, depending on your role. So um, I will say maintenance supervisors. The only time you are going to get involved in approving orders or even invoices is when you have a maintenance tech on site because they are going to have literally a one penny spend limit. Um, OK, Janet asked if if it's outside of the limits, will it automatically go to the regional or do we choose a manager? No, you it will automatically go to the regional. That's exactly how the we call it the hierarchy and that's exactly how it's set up. All right, so for those of you who are approvers, back to the, the tech, the maintenance techs are going to have a one penny spend. If you do have a maintenance tech on site, those of you who are maintenance supervisors will have things in your pending approval. All right, so make sure you kind of pay attention to this because it might happen. Uh, property managers and business managers, you absolutely will for any of your maintenance supervisors who are creating orders, um, you will start seeing things in here. So what this system is saying is right now, because we've only done orders as of this morning, I'm logged in as my uh, property manager. Now remember earlier, I was logged in as a maintenance supervisor and I created four orders. 
And so now those four orders need additional approval. So when I log in as my property manager, and by the way, ops is email crazy. So property managers, business managers, anyone who's an approver, you're going to receive an email. Hi, Janet, you have an order to approve. Okay, so just beware of that. Um, and then, you know, best practice guys, log into ops, I would say in the morning, in the evening, check it throughout the day um, if you have the opportunity because things are going to change. All right. So we're in here in our pending approvals. Well, now I've got to approve these orders. So how do I go about doing that? I'm going to select view. And it's going to bring up just a summary of the orders that require my approval. I don't see any of the detail. So that's what this little diagonal line is right here. If you want to view them individually, again, personal preference, whatever you want to do. If you want to open them all at once, use the diagonal line on the blue bar. And I'm going to go ahead and open all of them up. All right, so this looks a little different, but this is a summary of those orders that were created earlier this morning. And they've routed up to you because it was outside of the maintenance supervisor's spend or budget limits. And so notice that you have some buttons in here. And you have check budget, uh, save, approve, endorse, and reject. So these, this is where you are going to take action and Keep in mind too that it could be that it's even going to need additional approval, maybe the regional approval after yours. But this is where you have the ability to come in and you can make changes. So if the GL code is incorrect, you can change the GL code. All right, so this is where you can come in and make any changes. So let's just say on this one, I'm going to change the GL code. You can do the same thing with the keywords and hit the tab key, it will bring up in this case only those GLs whose um, descriptions contain the word office. So let's just say for this, um, I'm going to put this in rental expense office miscellaneous instead. All right, so I've got that in there. If you need to change the unit number, you can do that. Um, the things you can't change are, you know, the vendor. Um, and so this is where you know, you're going through your, your last bit of approvals. All right, so I'm looking through here. I can see that everything is the way it should be. Now I will tell you, you do not have the ability to split in here. If you'll notice, you have no ability to split. So if you need somebody to split this, it's going to have to be done back in the previous steps. So in that case, I would say let's reject. So with reject, ops is going to require that you put in workflow comments. So let me show you. If I select reject, notice that it's saying, oh, you've got to put in comments. You've got to tell the person why you're rejecting this. So I'm going to say, please split this between property. Goodness, I can't spell. Try again. One and two. Okay, so send it back to them. Now I can say reject. And so by selecting this, the system will come back and tell me that the order has been rejected. It's now back in the hands of the maintenance supervisor. It's on your dashboard. And in fact, property managers, you would be able to go into rejected orders also. All right, so that one's back in rejected. Um, I'm going to skip this one here and I'll come back to it in a minute. So now we're going to review this um, HD supply order right here. Everything looks good. I don't need to make any changes to this. And so on this one, I'm going to approve. Now what I want to point out is I am a property manager 2500, meaning I have a $2,500 spend limit. And so this order is for $1,761.42. All right, so in this case, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to approve. And the system's going to tell me order has been approved. All right, and it falls off my screen too. 
So what I want to point out to you, this is one that I entered yesterday. And the reason I did it is so you can kind of see hmm, what's missing here. The approve button. And the reason it's missing is because look at that. The system recognizes that this order is for $7,200. That's well over my spend. I do not have the ability to approve this order. I don't have the permission to approve this order. So I don't have the approve button, but I have endorse. You have endorse on every single order or invoice that you'll be approving. And let me tell you what that does. Endorse is simply saying, okay, I've reviewed it. I see it. I can't approve it. So I'm just going to endorse it saying, all right, I'm all right with this. But what's going to happen is it's going to automatically push up to the next person in the workflow approval. So in this case, it would go up to the regional manager. You have that option to do it on any order. So let's just say on the order down here for four imprint, you know you have the ability to approve. It's well within your spend limit. It's, let's see if it's within budget. It's within budget. But I really kind of want my regional manager to know what's going on. So if you wanted to on this, I would enter some buyer's notes and say, please make sure you're OK with this. And then you can endorse and that will automatically push it to your regional. But you do have the ability to approve if you want to. In this case, I don't even have the approve button because the spend is well over my limit. So all I can do is endorse. And now that's fallen off my screen. And on this one, I have a choice. I can either approve or like I said, if I wanted my regional to take a look at it, I would just simply put in some notes so they'll know because they're going to see those. And I will select endorse. So now if I go back to my dashboard, I have nothing else in my approvals. But if I go to all, I can see that there are seven orders. Three are pending my regional. One is already, four of them have already wound up going to the controller for approval. Okay, so now if I log in as the regional, There's those three orders. I'm going to select view. I'm going to expand my orders. And the one I want to show you is remember the one that I had a choice of approving or endorsing the one for the brochures. This is where my regional can see my notes and they do have the ability to approve. So this is just going to go on up the ladder. Um, so even if the regional at this point has the spend and the budget authority, it's still going to wind up with Carmen. Carmen, Carmen gets to approve every single order before it is um, fully approved. OK, guys, so regionals, you can come through here. Now, another thing I want to show you, if you want to call this a shortcut, there's also an action box right here. So if you prefer, instead of going one by one, this action box drop down has the same exact permissions. So what you can do in this case, if you don't want to do these little buttons down here, I'm going to approve this one. Next one, I'm going to approve this one. And the last one, I'm going to approve this one. And then you just select process selected orders. And then all three of them are going to come back and tell you that they have been approved. OK. And you close that out. Everything is off my screen as a regional. I have nothing to approve, but when I look at all. So now Carmen's going to be busy because she's got seven orders to approve. Now, guys, I'm going to go back to the whole thing of the status of the order, particularly the offline orders. Please be patient. Please wait until you see your order in pending order status before you call that order into your vendors.
okay? Because those don't get placed automatically. Offline orders are just like any order you place now with no catalog. You have to pick up the phone and call the vendor or email the vendor. All right, got some questions in here. Um, what is the turnaround time going to be for Carmen? Um, I believe Carmen has, yep, there she goes, <laughs> within a day, okay? All right, so Carmen will approve the HD supply order as long as it's in the system and over to HD by end of day. I believe the delivery policy is next day. Okay. Any questions about approvals? Because guess what? You're going to have another quick in class exercise. All right, let me get back over here. Uh, for property managers at multiple properties, do we have to check the pending approvals per individual property? So, no, anything you see in here, it doesn't matter. It's, um, it's going to be, um, regardless if it's a single property, multiple properties, if you oversee that property, it will be in here. Okay. Um, can we order and use this with self? I did. Um, I said relative to cell phones, and I thought I answered that. Um, no, here we go. Um, relative to qu the question about placing orders from cell phones, no. So it's on our roadmap. Uh, we do not ha have that capability yet. Now, for those of you who are approvers, we do have a mobile app. And I will provide the information for that as well. You can approve from your mobile phone. So if you're an approver, you can do that. Um, um, yeah, Kelly, we can kind of talk about your specific uh, instances. I know some of you guys that are, that are condos, it is a little bit different. The, the process really is not going to be much different. You'll still place orders. I understand on some of them, um, you're only doing external orders. It's not the um, unit related expenses. I remember having that conversation. So we can talk about things that are specific to you, um, maybe in a separate conversation. I forget to put the out of office on. Yes, so everyone has a limit, a time limit. So uh, anyone who's an approver has a, a time limit. So it could be 24 hours. In fact, hang on guys, I'll tell you what all your time limits are here. So let me get back in. So for business managers, property managers, your timeout for orders is 48 hours, and that's 48 hours uh, business days. It does not include weekends, and it's a full 48 hours. So today is um, Wednesday. I'm going to say it's noon my time. Um, an order hit my queue at 12 o'clock noon on Wednesday. I have until 12 o'clock noon on Friday to approve it. Guys, just keep in mind, if it needs additional approval, if you're holding things up, Right, so just just bear in mind when we get to invoices, you have 24 hours on invoices. OK, now that said, so um, Janet, if you are a property manager or business manager, an order winds up in your queue for approval. Um, it's going to sit there for 48 hours. If you have not set your out of office, it is going to sit there for 48 hours before it routes up to your regional. Okay, if you put your out of office on, it will never land in your pending approvals. It will automatically route to your regional. Okay, uh, let's see anybody else. Um, again, maintenance supervisors, the only time you will have orders to approve is if you have maintenance techs on site. So you only have 24 hours to approve orders. All right, regionals, you have 48 hours on orders and 48 hours on invoices.
So for the geo codes, will all of um, CJ's GL codes populate or only if we budgeted to a GL? Um, we do not load your entire chart of accounts in ops. So if you think about it, we only need codes that apply to things that have an expense, not income. We even leave out things like depreciation and amortization, even though those are an expense. That's not something you're going to process in ops. You're not going to place an offline order for something that would be coded to that. So even though your true Corker and Jenison chart of accounts might have 300 GL codes, the one in ops I think is just shy of 200. So I worked with your team on that. We determined which ones would be applicable. So those are the ones you're going to see. Okay, but it doesn't matter if there's a budget or not. If it's a budget of zero, it just means that mm, you're probably outside a budget and it's going to need additional approval. Okay, you guys ready to do your approvals? All right, here's your last exercise of the day. Uh, is there an option? Yes, there is an option to copy a PO. That is a great question, Nika, and I'll show you guys that just as soon as you go through this, okay? So go ahead, for those of you who are approvers, if you have something, so if everyone, I know not everyone was on the call, so some of you may not have anything to approve, but if you do, please go ahead and go through, kind of practice approving, endorsing, rejecting. I'll also show you how to get that rejected order out. Um, if you need something approved on a non, like on a weekend, um, I would say if it's on a weekend, that's something that uh, you probably need to reach out to your regional, let them know you've got something to approve, or if you're a maintenance supervisor, um, you have an emergency situation, um, you know, that happens. It does happen. So guys, don't get all caught up in, oh my God, you know, we had a hurricane come through and I didn't have time because I was too busy buying plywood uh, to, to go out and create an order. That, that, that's okay, guys. It happens. We know that. So just keep in mind that reality happens, okay? Um, I already mentioned about the mobile friendly. We do have a mobile app. So yes, if you are an approver, you can download the mobile app and I'll show you that information. Um, it is six minutes after. I'm going to give you guys, hmm, I'll give you about five minutes to do this. So at 11 after, we'll reconvene.
And I'll add to um, if we got any regionals on today, um, you might not have initially had anything in your pending approvals screen um, because they were waiting for the property manager. So as the property managers are going through this exercise, then those might wind up in your queue. Okay, just to try and keep everyone, keep us all on track with time, I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Hopefully you guys had an opportunity to go in and approve, endorse, reject, you know, go through that. So now let's kind of cover a couple of the questions that people have had. Um, someone asked about copying orders. Yes, indeed you can, and this is a really nice thing. So from any order, so while we're at it, let's go ahead and go through the uh, the orders summary screen. So when you go to orders, order summary, it's going to pull up all orders within a specified period of time. So this is where, remember, I showed you the filters, the little carrot here that opens up the filters. This is really important because if you'll notice, the date range on this is always 30 days. If you had an order with the date of 9-11, it wouldn't have shown up here. So you can always just completely remove the from date and then redo your search and find more orders. You can also use the filters to, and again, for you guys, it's going to set it to your property that you're assigned to. Um, so if, for instance, for property training, training property one, I wanted to find all units all orders, excuse me, that were coded to unit number 101. There they are, I can find them. So there's some really nice search features in here. You can search by vendor. My point being is just know that these filters are in here for you. So I'm going to reset my filters, go back to the top here, remove this guy and search. So back to copying an order. Um, I don't believe you can copy an online order. I may be lying. I don't think you can. No. But what you can do for any offline order, so let's go back to our order summary screen. So guys, you can tell online and offline orders here just like you can in your company and vendor directory. If the vendor's name is bold and blue, it's online. So this Pella windows and doors. Let's just say that, um, or let's go down to four imprint. That's probably an easier one. I'm going to select that one. And notice under more actions, I can clone right here. So find any order, and I believe it can be in any status. And, you know, let's just say we're, you know, a month down the road and you go, oh, you know, I need to order that same thing all over again. Find that order, come in, select clone, everything auto populates for you even the splits okay so you'll be able to do that so hopefully that answers your question about copying orders the other thing i want to cover real quickly remember we rejected some orders that's going to sit in here in our rejected orders bucket and so we want to make sure that we take care of these um, so let's go ahead and view those and remember i I um, rejected one. So you'll simply come in. And then down at the bottom where it's got additional information, you'll be able to see that it was rejected. And then here's the comment. Please split this between property one and property two. Because remember when we were going through the approvals there on that approval screen, we didn't have the ability to split. And I don't see that we have, oh, wait, hang on, edit. Um, okay, Claudia, I'm going to ask you, is splitting, once if it gets that far and it hasn't been split, do you know, could, oh, this is, you know what? This is not a good example. This is a online. Do you know if we can split? I think so, but not, yeah, not online. Maybe that's what the problem is. All right, let's see if the other, ah, oh, let's look at our Pella one. Let's see if we've got splits in here when we edit. No. 
Hmm. I will have to ask about that, guys. I'm going to ask about the splits and see uh, if that is part of the logic that it won't allow us to split once it's gotten through. Hmm. Interesting. I'll ask about that. OK, but anyway, um, on this one, the reason it was rejected, it says no more windows. All right. So in this case, you probably just want to underneath here, let's cancel and under more actions. In this case, you probably just want them to void it. So you can then just select void and void that particular order. OK, so it'll never go through approval. All right, let me touch base here. All right, we've gone through. I want to make sure we've gone through storefront and placing a catalog order. We've gone through offline orders, recurring orders, order approvals. Um, the one thing I do want to show you guys is the approve for. Now, for those of you who are a little bit concerned, so let's just say that um, the uh, property manager had an order sitting in his or her queue and the regional manager um, knew that the property manager was out and they'd forgotten to set their out of office and this is something that needs to get approved quickly for those of you who have people that report up to you in the hierarchy you can approve for so the way you do that is in this little checkbox here and let's take a look if i get lucky i, I might have some now, when you see that, it's saying, well, I don't have anything that I need to approve. Open your filter. You're going to approve for and then search. Aha. So this is where if regionals or even um, even property managers, if the maintenance tech ordered something and the maintenance supervisor was out of the office and forgot to set their out of office and you know this needs to get approved, you can do the same thing as long as someone reports up to you. So in this case, I can see that the regional manager can come in and approve for, in this case, Keystone, 1 to 2650 Pleasant. All right, so they'll be able to do that. So just keep that in mind. It goes to order approvals. You go to this screen. Open up your filters and instead of my approvals, it's going to be approve for. OK. All right. One more time, I'm going to harp on pending orders. All right, so guys, if it is a catalog order, you do nothing. You never have to worry about this. But if it is an offline order, in this case, I'm placed an order for Zumper. I can see that it's in pending status, fully approved. I can go ahead and call Zumper. But if I can see some other orders out here, and remember, guys, you can always go to from your uh, approvals page or your dashboard. You can go to orders and you can see who all is, if you want to say, holding things up, right? So it could be that, you know, Carmen hasn't gotten around to approving them just yet. So you'll know. You can also go to, let's go to the order summary. All of these you can see in pending workflow approval. You can also change this to change the order status. So if you want to see everything in pending, you select it. There should be only the one right now. Go back. I want to see only those things that are in pending workflow approval. And I can see all of those. And again, you can narrow down, use your filters to find the exact vendor. But this is where if your if your property or if your order has not yet been approved, it's in pending workflow approval. Please do not pick up the phone and call Pella Windows and Doors. You can even remember, open up the order and additional information. This one is in the regional manager's bucket to approve. OK, so that's how you can kind of keep keep an eye on what's going on. All right, we've been through the order of approval. We've been through the filters, additional information. Um, let me show you real quickly um, as far as orders go. We're, we've pretty well touched on everything. I will send these documents over to your team. This is the Ops Buyer mobile app. You cannot place orders on it. All right. There's, we're not yet there. 
that's something again that's on the roadmap. So for those of you who are placing orders, can't do that. But if you are an approver in the workflow, this is something that would come in handy. So I will send this over to your team so they'll have that. Um, the other thing I will send over to you guys is a quick steps. And I'll probably send this after we go through the invoices training tomorrow, but and I know it says, it says quick steps, but it is rather lengthy, but it does have kind of some nice um, reference points for you. So you'll have that to reference as well. And then tomorrow, what we'll do is for those of you who do create orders, and I understand that you know, we've set it so that everybody can create an order. Um, we're going to go through creating orders, approving orders uh, tomorrow. So that will be on the agenda. If you guys have any questions, we'll do first do a little bit of a recap on what we've done today. And then we'll move on into the invoices piece of it. So any questions? We're, we've got about eh, nine minutes. Um, yeah, so as far as editing an order, yeah, you, you well, I say that. Um, it depends on what you're trying to edit. If you're trying to, so Janet's asking, is there a way for a manager to edit an order instead of rejecting it? Um, when you get to that approvals page where you've got approve, endorse, reject, um, you have no way to remove line items. OK, so you can't edit it in that sense. Um, really, the only way you can, um, the only things you can edit would be the unit number, the GL code. So it would be things like that. OK. All right, if anybody has any other questions, you're most welcome to unmute yourself if you want to put it in the chat. Otherwise, that covers everything for orders. And we will meet again tomorrow at the same time for invoices. Thanks, Leslie. All right. Thank you all so much. And then tomorrow I'll also show you what the spin management tile in Unified Platform will look like. So you'll know how to find it. All right, guys, we will talk to you tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks so much. I stayed behind in case anybody else was sticking on with any questions. <laughs>